On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. All right, everybody, I'm here with Eric Yavarone of the Los Angeles Dodgers organization. Eric, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate your time. Tell the listeners about yourself, if you would, please. Uh, first off, Chris, thanks for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Like you said, my name is Eric Yavarone. Um, I'm a Connecticut guy uh, from the town of North Haven, Connecticut, right next to New Haven, where Yale University is. That's usually how I, how I explain where I'm from. Um, like you said, with the Dodgers, this will be my – Third year in total with the organization, second full season. Um, my first year I was in like an intern seasonal type role where I came for extended, so this will be my second spring training and second full season. Um, this season I'll be, be in the Cal League. I'll be going to our high eight team in Rancho Cucamonga and uh, getting ready to head out spring training really soon. So um, you've done a little bit of private setting stuff before getting into baseball. Um, kind of go into the private setting and even m- maybe as far back as your playing days and uh, kind of what you experienced there, what's similar, what's different with pro ball and how it's helped you in the pro ball setting. Okay, yeah, sure. So I played baseball in college. Um, I went to the University of Connecticut where I played played for four years. So in between, I guess my work with the private sector kind of started with a mini internship at Cressy Sports Performance, which was between my um, semesters, my senior year. Um, so for four or five weeks, I was driving up there and just kind of seeing what it was like. And that was a good time of year to be there because there was a ton of uh, minor league baseball players there right before they were, were ready to report. So after my senior year of playing, um, senior year did not go very well in the field for me at all. So I kind of we was in that weird stage where we kind of got to figure out what's next. So I reached back out to the guys at Cressy's, um, ended up going back there for a full internship. So this would be the fall of fall of 15. So I did the full internship program there. And then after that, before I came to the Dodgers, I worked at Rand Phone Training Systems, which is in Hamden, Connecticut. Great facility, um, if you guys haven't heard of it. Um, so... Like I said, right from there, I went went into pro ball. So I think really it helped me out a lot because the private setting, I can only speak on my experiences, but the private se- setting, I think, really helped me out with the facilities I was at in terms of uh, assessment, in terms of programming, and then ultimately I think the coaching experience helped a lot as well. So I guess we'll talk about assessment first. By being able to sit in um, and watch the assessment process at CSP and then take part in some bit of RTS, uh, very similar to kind of what we do, what we do in Brobot at least, um, with our organization. So, and then being able to see how that assessment process turns into a individualized program. So for me in college, you know, we used the FMS, but it was very much a, you know, used for what it's supposed to be, a screening tool for us and then participate in training, right? Um, where it was kind of more more detailed, I guess, in the private setting. So that's kind of, like I said, how we do it with the Dodgers. So it definitely prepared me for being able to program for all the guys, making our templates and then tailoring them um, to the individual needs of that guy. And then I would say last, the coaching piece. So to me, um, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, like our setting is very much semi-private because it's not like in college where – 12.30, we're tipping off and we're warming up as a team and barbells are going in the air on a timer and all that stuff, right? So the guys kind of come in as they want, you know, within a certain window and you're bouncing around, you're coaching them. And I think that's kind of that's kind of how it was in the semi-private um, model that the two facilities I had time at did it. So I think in those those senses, it really, uh, really prepped me for pro ball. That's a good way to describe it, man, semi-private. I never really thought about it that way but you're 100 percent true there yeah right you just kind of try to hit everybody and and you know pick and choose where you want to get in there and coach and and um yeah yeah that's what i would say 
So clearly uh, your private setting work has helped you in pro ball because you were strength coach of the year this past year in the Arizona League. So congrats on that. Um, this is kind of becoming <laughs> it's kind of becoming a reoccurring theme on the uh, podcast. I've had a bunch of people lately that have been strength coach of the year, and I keep saying it's it's an award voted on by your peers. So clearly you're doing something right in the eyes of your peers. Um, what is it that you're doing that makes you so successful? Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's necessarily w like one thing. I think I'm just. I'm just trying to trying to do the job well and try to create a good environment for the guys. Um, like you said, to have an award voted on by your peers, like it's a great. It's a great honor. I definitely was not expecting to win that award um, because I felt like I could have done a better job going over and talking to the other strength coaches and making sure we got to spend some time together. You know, it's kind of tough being on the field two minutes before the game starts and then walking over and getting in contact with the guys, especially in the AZL because it's quick in and out type thing. Um, but, you know, I tried to, tried to, like I said, create a good, good environment for the guys before the game. We would have a meeting, just talk about maybe it looked constructive from the outside, but we were, we were just joking around, <laughs> clapping it up and stuff like that. So I don't know if they noticed, but, but like I said, I definitely wasn't expecting to win it. It was great, and it's it's even more special, like you said, because because it's voted on by the other strength coaches. The guys I did meet were all very good guys, very good strength coaches. So definitely pretty cool to win that award. Yeah, for sure, man. It's all it's all about how it looks, right? <laughs> if it looks professional from the other side, it's got to be professional. So yeah, like we were we were in there. I remember this one guy. We drafted this kid, great kid. I love him. He uh, he was wearing all black cleats every day, and it just wasn't a good look. So the day he showed up with blue cleats. We brought it up and we clapped for him on the blue cleats and, and we were just having a good time, just just messing around, you know, just just trying to loosen up the guys a little bit before they took the field. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. So, what do you believe in general makes a strength and conditioning coach successful? Whew. I mean, you know, obviously knowing the X's and O's helps, um, but I think I think being a really good coach and being able to, like, I've seen, I feel like I've seen guys that maybe didn't. You know, they, they knew their stuff, but there was other people, I guess you could say, maybe knew more. But they were way more effective than that person because they were able to relate. They, they knew the guys. They knew how to, they knew what made them tick. They knew what kind of learner they were, um, what kind of cues worked best for them. Um, and, and, you know, they made a, maybe a decent program great because they were able to do those things versus the great program if you have no – social skills and you can't talk to anybody, then, then what good is it, right? If, if you can't coach, I think obviously your X's and O's are important, but if you take pride in being a really good coach, um, getting to know your guys and really just showing them you care, like just, just nobody wants to deal with a guy that's angry all the time. Do they, you know, people that are smiling, open and stuff like that. I think, I think just doing things like that make, make you way more approachable and, and make you a way better coach. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more with you, man. The, uh, you know, showing that you care to the guys, they, they really will uh, buy in more than if you're just yelling at them all the time and, you know, looking pissed off all the time. So, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, you can, you can tell when somebody legitimately cares. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, they can sniff it out when you don't, when you, uh, when you're yeah. just faking it. So <laughs> they're smarter than, uh, than a lot of people give credit for, man, I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you are crazy for believing? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I, th I think, yeah, I think we'll talk kind of like about what I'm doing now. So um, I think what might sound a little crazy is right now for this off season, like, I mean, don't get me wrong, like we, we could study and get some, get some good content kind of during season, but I feel like off season is really where, where we can make that thing, that stuff happen, right? So I kind of made a decision to to not really study like performance parameters this offseason, like strength and power, and endurance, and all that stuff that we would usually be be studying. I I kind of decided to take a different route, and I went to massage therapy school this offseason um, because I really believe that you know where this whole thing's heading is is the more, or I guess I could say the the, the better we blur the line between strength coach and PT and athletic trainer, like the better we're going to be. And, and not to say like I want to function as an athletic trainer or physical therapist. I don't. I want to be a strength coach. But 
the better we can communicate with them and the better we can see their side of things really helps. So I, I really am interested in, in being a manual therapist and being able to get my hands on guys. And I think it's going to help out a lot. So, and thus far, I'm not done yet, but thus far it has helped. I think just being able to really understand anatomy and really, you know, attachments, origins, insertions, um, being able to palpate palpate tissue assess the quality of it like what's really going on is it actually tight and dense and fibrotic is it is it more of a neurological tension type situation like being able to get your hands on guys and feel it, instead of just looking at a book and saying yeah you know your your rhomboids are in this area but but seeing the layers and what muscles are on top of it what muscles are below and you know, kind of the three-dimensionalness of the body i think i think doing those things will help a lot down the road so when i do get back to really studying all those great things that we want to do, I think I'll be able to appreciate them a little more because because the, the principles of anatomy aren't really going to change. So that was kind of the decision I made this off season. I think it's helping out a lot. I guess we'll ultimately see down the road. Um, but definitely a couple eyebrows raised when I told them I was going to go go do massage school this off season. But those are the reasons why I did it. And um, I think it'll help out as a strength coach in the long run. I would highly encourage any strength coach that, feels the same way or is thinking about maybe doing something like that, I would definitely say go ahead and do it because I think it really will help you out a lot. Yeah, I'm a big believer myself in being well-rounded, so it doesn't really sound crazy to me that you're going to massage therapy school. Maybe to some people it does, but uh, I definitely understand the value of of what you're trying to say. So kind of go into that a little bit for me, just in case somebody is interested in massage therapy school. What kind of uh, curriculum are you doing? Like how frequently do you go to school? What are your days like? Um, Just kind of go into it just in case there is a listener that uh, wants to hear more. Yeah, hundred percent. So I think I heard the connection was a little, little off. So, so kind of what the layout has been for me. Um, So, you know, you go in, you go to school, right? So there's class. So basically right now I'm I'm working and the guys in the morning at the stadium and then I'm going to class at night so you have different different courses have different topics so when you first go to school you're going to do um, you know your anatomy course and your Swedish massage the anatomy course is very basic like if you were involved like if you're involved in anything like like we are you should be good it's more so maybe I guess for people that have never taken anatomy course which is you know but it's a good review if you have already heard it before and then you go into Swedish which is you're, you know, you're, you're kind of like fluff, right? You're superficial, circulatory relaxation type massage. It's a little weird, to be honest with you. I don't think I'm really going to use it often, but it gives you, it gives you a base for, for how to, for your touch, right? And how to, and how to kind of put your hands on the body, right? Um, but then after that, once you finish that, you get into more of the applicable stuff, like in my mind for us, like you get into your deep tissue upper body, um, and then a lower body, two separate classes for the particular school that I'm at. And then you get into, you kind of pick your electives. Like there's a sports injury massage class. There's a myofascial release class. So you take these different courses, you build up your hours. And then once you meet the hour requirements, you get to take the test to become certified um, in massage. So that's kind of the layout. Um, I've been really fortunate to go to a great school. My teacher um, has done a great job because he does know why I'm interested in doing it and why I am doing it. I'm not the first of our, our guys in the organization to do this. Um, our our uh, coordinator did it last year. Um, but he's done a really good job of tailoring kind of more towards my world as opposed to somebody who may actually want to work in a spa and give a massage. So it's definitely been, it's been a great experience, like I said. But the layout, um, it's kind of like that. It's a class, it's a class setting, yeah. Cool, man. That's pretty interesting. Um, I might pick your brain more on it when we're when we're off the camera here. But uh, what advice do you have for others in the field? So I guess I would say my my advice for anybody in the field. I think it's really important to. I don't want to say like limit yourself and pick one path, but if you kind of have an idea of where you want to go with this, I think you could kind of start kind of tailoring your path in that direction. Like for example. I thought I wanted to do professional baseball. Like I was a baseball player. Um, I really liked the training component of it. Probably why I'm in this in what I'm doing now. Um, but you know, seeing that, okay, I want. I think I want to do baseball. So being able to do an internship at a place like Cressy Performance that deals with a lot of baseball players. That was probably something that I should have said in the how did the private sector help me in pro ball? Literally, the people I was dealing with every day was minor league baseball players. That's what I'm doing now. So what better way to get you ready to deal with minor league baseball players than to deal with minor league baseball players? 
you know, maybe if uh, if you want to do football and your first internship in, in the university setting, if you have to do that, you know, try to work with a football team. Um, but with that being said, I might contradict myself a little bit. I would say don't limit yourself either. Like me being able to do college and me being able a little internship at UConn in college and being able to kind of live in that world as an athlete and then being able to um, work in the private sector, intern and work in the private sector, two great facilities, and then being able to do pro ball. Like after my first year, I was, I was an intern, right? So after my first year, I could have said, screw this, I hate it, and then been out. But at least I did all three, you know what I'm saying? I, I was able to, to spend a little bit of time in all three, so I know which one suited me best. Like when I did first day college, I was like, no chance. This is not me at all. I don't like to yell. I don't like to scream. I like to talk to people. I like, you know what I mean? So that kind of ruled that one out. And then private sector, private sector work, but pro ball has worked, I think, even better because it's in a way kind of like college and private combined a little bit in a way. Um, but being able to get your feet wet in many in as many different areas to figure out which one works best for you and at the same time also, but if you do have a clear cut, this is what I want to at least give a shot to, you know, try to find little ways like that to maybe pick and choose how you can dictate that path towards that direction. Yeah, then I was going to say, of course, just, you know, study a lot. I mean, I think I studied more now than I did in college. It seems like we all do. So um, I definitely, you know, that doesn't, that plays a huge role in it as well, of course. Yeah, man. Uh, studying is obviously huge. Um with that kind of where are you going for continuing ed? Obviously, you said you're doing massage therapy school and you're kind of getting away from the X's and O's. But um, are you reading any books, attending podcast or attending seminars, listening to podcasts? Like where are you going for continuing ed or are you counting massage therapy school as <laughs> you're continuing ed this off season? So I, I, I wouldn't. Yes. On the back of Yes. Massage school is definitely the focus. But I would say like. It's more so like the whole like the whole theme, like annual therapy, anatomy, movement, the body, like more so that area right now. So I'm obviously going to class, which is a huge component. But on the side, um, I'm using a book called Trail Guide to the Body, which is huge, which has been great. It's a it's an anatomy book, but it's also a palpation book. So not only does it tell you, you know, this muscle origin insertion action, but it tells you how to find a boning, a boning landmark, and then to work off of that to find the structure so you know hopefully you're on it, right? So that's been a great book I've been using this off season. I'm also using an online resource called Brooke Bush Institute, um, which was recommended by uh, my boss, and it's really cool. I'm more of a like a visual kind of guy and listening to stuff. I think that works better for me than reading. I still try to do it anyway, but it's definitely it takes me forever. So it's been a really cool one because it, it kind of shows you, like it's almost like courses, right? You can go through an anatomy course, you can go through a, a movement course, you can go through a uh, different different manual therapy techniques, joint mobilizations, things like that. And it's all kind of videotaped and the guy does a pretty good job of putting it all together. Um, that's kind of, like I said, what my off season has been. Um, but I listen to like Mike Robertson podcast every morning coming into work. That's how I kind of stay to with strength conditioning stuff too. I did write down a couple books that I think are staples that I go back to a lot with more training side of things. Um, Joel Jameson, MMA conditioning. That's that's my go-to for conditioning stuff all the time. I use it endlessly. Um, I like the Mike Boyle books, the functional training books. I've done those. I like them a lot. I think they're great. Um, and movement, movement by Greg Cook was, was probably my favorite book. I would still say that's my favorite book to this day. Um, those are three that stick out in terms of more like staples. And then course wise, um, I think honestly the course that set me on this this whole actually going ahead and doing a uh, manual therapy type situation was the FRC course, functional range conditioning. Um, Dr. Spina, it's you know it's a it's a great course, but I think what it did for me was. You know, it gave me a great system for mobility training, which I use, which is the most important thing. Uh, well, actually, that's a lie. I would say, which is very important. But I think the most important thing was probably the way he goes into detail and he takes it down to the cellular level on what he's trying to do. So I think it just really opened my eyes to if you dive really deep into things, it, it gives you an understanding of the principles, the scientific principles, and then from there you can do whatever you want with it, right? Like the principles aren't going to change. So I think uh, that was a great course. If you haven't heard of it and haven't went to it, um, I highly, highly recommend it.
the FRC keeps popping up um, with people that I talk to, so it's definitely something I'm going to have to get into. Um, it sounds like it's a really good course. It's great. It's great. And then I was a, I was really lucky. I was able to do the FRA too, which was the assessment course. And when I was there, that was a cool course too because um, it gives you the FRC, which is the mobility side of things, which is more for us as like trainers and strength coaches, but there's also a lot of carryover with the FR, which is like the manual therapy thing as well. So I think that's another thing that kind of sparked my interest in this whole thing because like I was like, shoot, I would love to go to that course, but I can't because I'm not a manual therapist. So, you know, now I guess I'll be able to after I finish this thing up. So I think just that whole that whole uh, whole system in general, they're they're great courses and I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. For sure. When I attend mine we'll uh we'll talk more. We'll Oh yeah, those. let me know. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go. All right, man. I know you had a long day at work today, and I'm hoping we can get a lightning round in. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. Don't don't stump me, though. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I got four questions for you. First one, who is your biggest influence in the field of strength and conditioning? Ah, man. Can I name more than one? Is that against the rules? No, go right ahead. You can name as many as you'd like. Okay, all right. I gotta go. I gotta go with first Maureen Butler, who was my strength coach at the University of Connecticut. She has to be Number one, because uh, I actually, if you really want to go deep into the story, um, I would say when I was like a sophomore in college, I thought I was going to the big leagues. So school was not, I, you know, I did my schoolwork, but it was it was not my focus. The baseball was, and the school of kinesiology did not want to let me into the program. Um, I would have got denied, and I never would have got to study exercise science. But she put in a word, and I think kind of the uh, maybe the way I went about my training and stuff like that and being a good teammate and stuff like that, she recommended. So give this kid a shot. He'll work hard and he'll figure it out. And that's kind of what happened. Once I got into the curriculum and I kind of enjoyed it and got serious about making this my life after baseball, it kind of took off a little bit, um, but literally would not be here if it wasn't first. So she's number one. After that, I got to say, oh man, a lot of people come to mind. Mike Ranfone, um, who's the owner of Ranfone Training Systems, he um, opened up his facility me, for me to train when I was still playing and then to intern and work after, um, like we talked about. Um, his whole staff was great. There's a guy, Todd Bumgarner, there who's since moved on. He works at a gym in Virginia now. He's been a huge influence to me. He was the one that told me to pack the bag and move across the country to Arizona in the first place. So he's a huge influence. And then, you know, Eric Cressy and his whole staff, too, um, letting, me, letting me intern at their facility multiple times. Um, learned a ton from them to get me ready to go for this whole thing like we talked about earlier so those are people that come to mind I know I'm missing a couple but um, you know those are those are the ones that jumped out right away no hard feelings from anybody else that you might have missed (laughs) Uh, number two one piece of equipment (laughs) to train with what would it be Ooh, um, dumbbells 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 yeah I'm gonna go dumbbells because the ability to train bilaterally and unilaterally easily i'll go with dumbbells uh third one biggest accomplishment professionally and or personally hmm okay um i mean probably the azl strength coach of the year right probably because we were just talking about it so it popped into my mind but it was i think that was like we said earlier that was it was i was happy to win because i wasn't expecting it because it's voted on by the other strength coaches so that makes it a little more meaningful um that was that was great i think um i mean the opportunity to be here in la right now i think is has been a huge accomplishment it was i never thought i would be in pro ball this early at all let alone be able to help out with the big league guys right now at the stadium so i think that's another huge accomplishment that i'm really enjoying um yeah i would say those two those two are the biggest things right now Last one, any career other than strength and conditioning, what would you choose? Career other than strength and conditioning? Yeah. Um, man. Hmm. Maybe, maybe a sports agent? I think being an agent would be pretty cool, obviously. I mean, with that being said, I know absolutely nothing about what really goes on, but it seems pretty cool from what I have gathered. I mean, you get to go assess talent, you get to, to pick guys you want to try to, to get on board with you, you get to negotiate contracts, like, so it seems like a pretty cool job in the outskirts, um, so yeah, we'll go with sports agent. 
when I was really little, I wanted to be a sports agent. So <laughs> it's cool that somebody else had the same train of thought. Um, all right, man. It, it's been it's been awesome. Uh, if the listeners want to get in touch with you, where can we hear more from you? Are you on social media? Yeah, um, I would say I would say Instagram is your best bet. Um, I have Twitter and Facebook, but I'd probably delete my Facebook if I wasn't in some like groups on there and whatnot. So I would say Instagram. I'm the most active with. I don't post like a ton of training stuff on there necessarily uh, i'm not really into that a whole lot right now um it's more just like my personal page but i'm on there all the time so you can send me a message on there no problem uh, my email personal email is my last name yavarone y-a-v-a-r-o-n-e dot eric at gmail.com uh, check that a lot as well so i mean feel free feel free to reach out here to help Perfect. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Appreciate your time, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. All right, everybody. That concludes our episode with Eric. I hope you enjoyed this one. Between pro ball, the private setting, and massage therapy school, he's got a lot of really interesting stuff going on, and I'm glad he was able to share some of his experience with us. Three things that I took from Eric. The principles don't change. Take pride in being a great coach, and find work that is relevant to what you want to do. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll talk to you again on the next one.